Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Christopher Kimball back to our series. We invite you to visit our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations much like this, including one from Chris's last book where Russ Parsons interviewed him. Christopher's new book is Milk Street Cookish. Throw it together, big flavors, simple techniques, 200 ways to reinvent dinner. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Street is located in downtown Boston at 177 Milk Street and is home to a cooking school, a bi-monthly magazine, and a public television and radio shows. They are authors of Milk Street, The New Rules, Milk Street Cookbook, and Milk Street Tuesday Nights. We'll ask him some questions as he does uh, two fantastic cooking demonstrations for us. So welcome to Live Talks Los Angeles, Christopher. Great to have you back with us. My pleasure. I'm thrilled that um, this is the same place that did Governor Cuomo and Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> I feel that's really good company. It doesn't get any better than that, man. <laughs> so uh, thanks. Well, why don't we start off? Let uh, Tell us about the title of the book, Cookish. Where does that come from? Uh, uh, I came up with that uh, to indicate that it's not, you know, it's not serious cooking. It's cookish, which means it has six ingredients. It doesn't take too long. There's only one pan. Uh, and then, you know, you make a recipe one time, then you can basically go back and make it again without the recipe. So it's uh, easy on technique, big on flavor. So it's, it's cookish, right? So tell us about the first recipe we're going to look at. Uh, well, all these recipes, the concept is that you start with big flavors and then you end up with big flavors. Unlike French cooking, where you end up, you start with blander ingredients that need a lot of time, heat, and technique to develop flavor, right? Like a stew. Here, you're starting with big flavors. So the technique, the part in between the beginning and the end is actually easy to do. So we're going to do a, a chicken a Thai red curry stir fry. We're going to start with some coconut oil. Um, heat that up to just before it smokes. And then we have a pound and a half of chicken to go in. So we're starting instead of using regular vegetable oil with coconut oil. And then the secret to this recipe, similar to this uh, secret to the next recipe, is something very powerful, red, a Thai red curry paste. It has shrimp paste in it, lemongrass, garlic, obviously red chilies. So if you have a small number of great pantry ingredients, uh, you can really make cooking much faster and much easier. So that's, that's one of the things in this recipe that really transforms it. When we finish the recipe, we're also going to add some lime juice and a couple handfuls of herbs. You know, um, in Mastering the Art of French Cooking, you might have a tablespoon of chervil, you know, uh, but you don't have handfuls of herbs. Uh, and most people around the world use lots of herbs. So we have, um, you can use mint, you can use basil, you can use... Uh, Cilantro, I'm going to put the chicken in now. Um, I'm just going to cook this for a couple of minutes. Uh, just till it starts to brown a little bit. Turn that down just a little. So, you know, we, we travel the world all the time, at least we used to from Milk Street. We'll be back on the road next year. But, um, you know, we find that people's cooking is fairly simple, right? It's not complicated, uh, but the ingredients they have at their disposal are more powerful, but they also understand layering, right? So they have sweet and sour. You know, a lot of places like in the Middle East, you don't necessarily have dessert. You might have something sweet in the afternoon, but there's usually a sweet component along with the savory as you cook. Uh, there's crunchy, there's creamy. Bitter is a flavor, uh, a really key foundation flavor in lots of places in the world. So sour is really important. So when you start combining those different things, sour and bitter with sweet and savory, there's more complexity in the food. So when you taste it, uh, it's not just one thing. You know, very often in, in European cooking, Northern European cooking, like French cooking, um, there's complexity, but it's all of a piece, like, like a a beef stew. It's rich and it's deep and has a lot of layers, but the flavors are all very similar. It's a umami baham. Other places in the world, you have radically different textures and flavors going on. So it is a lot more interesting. It's also easier to do. So, Chris, tell us about the choice of coconut oil versus, say, olive oil or any other oil. 
Uh, coconut oil is used all the time in lots of places in the world. Uh, it's, it's fairly uh, high heat for smoking. Uh, it just adds a base of flavor. That's all, just another way of adding flavor. Um, for my cooking at home, I'll just use grapeseed oil most of the time. Um, there's no need to use olive oil. I mean, olive oil is this, this concept that obviously came out of Italy because that's what they had. They had olives, right? So they used olive oils for everything. If you're going to cook, there's no point using an expensive olive oil because all the aromatics are going to burn off. So just a basic neutral oil is fine. Uh, I would stay away from canola oil, which I think tastes like fish to me. <laughs> has kind of an off flavor. It's a little greasy. Um, so sunflower oil, grapeseed oil, sort of my basic oil. But you could also use coconut oil if you want a particular flavor profile. Also, when you're sauteing chicken, it's going to release after a while. So if you try to move it off the bottom of the pan too early, it's going to stick. So some of these pieces are already starting to move. Now, are we at a medium heat there, Christopher, or a high heat? Yeah, it's about on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, it's about a 7, so it's medium-high. Um, you don't want it too hot, uh, but if it's too low, it's going to steam. Maybe I'll get it up a little higher. So now it's starting to release nicely from the pan. Another 45 seconds or so, then we'll dump in the, the Thai red curry paste uh, and half a pound of green beans. You could use red peppers. You could use almost anything. And the, uh, the Thai curry paste, this is a store-bought item or is this something we can fix at home? No, it's store-bought. There are lots of brands. Um, we, um, we actually have a store where we sell some of these things. It, it's good to get a good quality one. There's, you know, the, the Thai brand is something you find in all the supermarkets. Uh, but as I said, it has lemongrass, it has shrimp paste to it, uh, has, has red chilies, it'll have some garlic, it'll have salt, a few other things, maybe some spices. Okay, we're almost there. So both of the recipes I'm doing now are like 10 minutes, uh, other than finding the stuff in your pantry and bringing it out, uh, which is always the most lengthy part. All right. Does marinating that chicken in advance uh, help in any way? Excuse me? Does marinating that chicken in advance help in any way? Uh, mar in generally, marinating doesn't do anything because it doesn't get deep into meat. If you have thin pieces of chicken like this, yeah, you could marinate. You wouldn't want to do it for more than half an hour because it's so thin it would get into it. So you could do it. Um, just remember, it's about a quarter inch of penetration into any kind of meat. So a big roast of some kind isn't going to do you any good. Also, when you marinate <clears throat> the uh, products like garlic and those sorts of things, they don't actually get into uh, the meat. The salt does, uh, but other, other items tend not to. Stir frying without a wok. You, you could definitely use a wok here. We're just going to uh, cook this briefly until the paste browns a little bit.
And if we went through just a little bit of water. And now we'll just cook this until the beans are just tender. Now are we so doing anything different minutes. if we if we go the route of the bell peppers instead of the beans? Uh, you can certainly do that. I mean, the, in the book, by the way, there are substitutions listed in the ingredients. So if you can, it, we might suggest two or three substitutions for a key ingredient. Uh, I mean, for example, you could use, you know, thinly cut sliced pork. Uh, tenderloin for this would work fine. Um, so, yes, we, we do list sub substitutions in the in the recipes. So that'll just take another minute or two to get the beans uh, tender. And how's that taste? Uh, yeah. Good. This is not a bad job, you know. This really is not a bad job. <laughs> Any other slight deviations from the recipe that you might uh, suggest we dabble with or experiment with? Yeah, you could use if you wanted to. Um, uh, but first of all, let me say the red curry paste will vary in heat level depending on what brand you buy. So I'm always cautious going into this. I might start with two tablespoons instead of three, just until I get the heat level. <clears throat> I mean, you can go out and buy some that will blow your head off. So you want to be careful with that. Uh, you can certainly do this with fish sauce. You could do this with soy sauce. <clears throat> you could do this with a combination of uh, fish sauce and lime juice and a little sugar as a sauce or soy sauce and mirin, you know, you could put together. So you could use any of the, the sort of Southeast Asian uh, basic sauce combinations for this. One thing I found interesting in the book, Christopher, is you say cookish and you sort of describe it as the weeknight meal as opposed to the weekend meal. Why the difference? It's a good question. I think <clears throat> the difference is uh, <laughs> based on me starting to cook in the 70s when Saturdays I used to cook all day and people think about entertaining. I think these days that's probably not so much true. Um, and I think the whole notion of the amount of time you spend prepping and cooking a meal is somehow related to the quality of the meal, uh, which isn't necessarily true. Sometimes it is. So, uh, yeah, very often on a Saturday night I'll cook the same way. I think Saturdays and the Sundays in particular, if you have the time, I mean, part of the reason we do Milk Street and do this book is to get people to arrive at the point where they go like, yeah, I kind of like that cooking thing. You know, it's not like it's an inconvenience and you have to get food on the table. Of course, that's true sometimes, uh, but you enjoy it. So during on a Saturday afternoon, I like to cook. So I probably would choose something that does take longer to cook just because I like it but there's no reason you have to. And, and the point of the book is you can end up with great stuff quickly um, if, you know, if you don't have a lot of time. And a lot of times we don't have a lot of time. Okay. That's about there. Nice. Okay, now <clears throat> we have Mint, which I love. A little bit of lime juice. And we'll just cook this until um, it wilts a bit. And I should say one other thing, you know, when you're um, cooking, the most important part is that last 30 seconds because people don't tend to taste the food before, um, before they serve it. So it may be under salted. Uh, it may need a little ginger, made a little garlic. 
a little like vinegar is something you could add, something a little bit sweet at the end. Uh, pomegranate molasses, for example, is a great sort of Middle Eastern staple to have around. It's sour, but sort of sweet. Just need salt. So <clears throat> if you adjust the flavorings at the end, you can go from good to great or from mediocre to good. Uh, it's really critical. Now, obviously, if it's something kind of coming out of the oven that's baked, that's a little harder. But with the stir fry, a soup stew, you can certainly do it. So, what about lemon versus lime, Christopher? Uh, is this a philosophical question? <laughs> no. it sounds deep, man. <laughs> the choice of when might when might when might go with the route with lemon as opposed to lime. What, what do we? What, I, th I think lime is ubiquitous and generic. <clears throat> I think lemon. I think lime has a very particular flavor. Which, which makes sense in a context, but I don't think it works all the time. For example, if you're gonna do uh, a French lemon tart, uh, doing a French lime tart is just a very different thing entirely. I, I think lime also is a more of a, of a savory ingredient than lemon. Lemon works great in desserts, you know? But I, I, I view lime as something I really like on, in savory dishes like this. Okay, so that was actually 10 minutes maybe, something like that, easy to do. That was easy. So now we're gonna do something else which is uh, a little more interesting, but it has the same concept, which is uh, caramel uh, shrimp. This is a concept, as everyone probably knows, from Vietnam, uh, and you start with sugar. So if you have sugar, put that over there, Um, we're taking an ingredient everybody has at home, sugar, a quarter cup, putting it in a skillet, putting in uh, two tablespoons of water, uh, and now we're going to turn that into caramel. So the idea of taking something everybody has and transforming it uh, into, in this case, something savory. Uh, if you cook caramel long enough uh, and dark enough, it loses that sweetness, that syrupy sweetness, it's sort of like a dark maple syrup versus a light one. Uh, it will give you a nice savory foundation for a recipe. So we're going to do that now. Uh, it's helpful to use a skillet uh, because you can see the color of the syrup as it cooks down. Uh, if you use a nonstick skillet, that would not be a good idea because it's dark. It would be hard to see. Um, many people who make caramel don't use water. It makes it a little bit easier to do. Uh, but you can just use sugar, uh, and I know that uh, a number of bakers I know just use sugar in the pan, but this way you can see. Now, if you used a saucepan, <clears throat> it would start to froth up at the top, and it'd be very hard to see down into the liquid. The critical thing about making caramel, especially this recipe, because you want to get it dark, is watching the color. Um, it's going to smoke. You'll smell it. Um, but you really got to watch the color. Now, as we do this, um, we're going to take it on and off the heat because the pan's hot. When it starts, the color starts to go, it starts to go. Uh, and so by taking it off the heat, you slow it down. If you left it on the heat the whole time, that window of getting it just right would be really tough to measure. Also, if you wait till the color is just right on the heat, by the time you take it off the heat, it's gonna continue cooking. You know, a lot of people say it's a good point that <clears throat> there's two kinds of cooking, on the heat and off the heat, or like baking, in the oven, out of the oven. You take cupcakes or cookies out of the oven, they continue to bake, right? Because there's, there's uh, residual heat. Same thing with a hot pan and a sugar syrup. Uh, once uh, you take it off the heat, it's still gonna retain heat. Uh, so you have to watch it carefully. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to um, underdo this, you can, <clears throat> but if it's too light, as I said, is this going to be sweet? It's not going to have that slightly bitter depth to it, which is what you want. This is a shrimp dish. Okay, now you can see there's a little bit of color here. It's just starting to turn. So 
So that's good. Now I can smell it uh, starting to smoke a little bit, which is good. Feels like I'm sugaring in Vermont, making maple syrup. Same smell. And what's the heat level at right about now? Medium? Seven, medium high. Needs to be high enough to, you know, to cook the, the sugar, the syrup. Now you're going to get some smoke. Now it's starting to go. So I'll just take it off for a second. So it's still not quite there. I'm going to give it a little more. It's getting close. And yeah, now it's getting nice and dark. And this is the point at which you completely panic. You throw in the sink. Okay. So that's what you want. You want it nice and dark. I'm taking it off the heat, adding fish sauce. Some shallots, some Fresno chilies, or you can use serranos, a little ginger, and a little black pepper. So this recipe has, before I even get the protein in there, the shrimp, it just has massive amount of flavor here, right? Chilies, shallots, ginger, pepper, uh, fish sauce. Fish sauce is nothing but fish, really. Uh, it sits in a barrel for a year or more with salt. Uh, the good stuff is not fishy. It's very umami, but it's not fishy. So that's one ingredient where it really pays to spend three or four bucks more in a bottle. Uh, Red Boat's a good brand that you can find lots of places. Shrimp goes in, pound and a half. These are 21 25s, which are uh, extra large, large shrimp. 21 to 25 a pound. And these are only going to take a couple minutes to cook, even faster than the chicken. Uh, you do not want to overcook them, they want to just become opaque. A uh, couple minutes will be done. Again, don't overcook them. Another way to cook shrimp, by the way, is cook them on one side, take them off the heat, put the cover on, let it sit five minutes, and they'll come up the temperature slowly. That's another way to do it. Um, but shrimp are very quick cooking. So that's pretty much the recipe. Wow. Looks delicious. Yeah, uh, come over for dinner. We got lots, lots of extras. I'll go get my mask on, hop on a plane, and, <laughs> <laughs> and be here in eight hours. Yeah. Right. Um, let me ask you this, uh, Christopher, with the um, pandemic, obviously, a lot of people are looking at cooking at home. A lot of restaurant scene is very different. Uh, any tips for people, uh, you know, who might otherwise feel like they can't do it or they're uncomfortable with cooking? I mean, these both these recipes look terribly easy yeah, and very not, not terribly time consuming. Any pointers you're giving people? Uh... Well, I think um, what's really important is if you, don't, if, if you did not cook a lot before March, uh, I would get 10 recipes, maybe eight to 10 recipes. Make those recipes over and over again until you get good at them. I mean, they could be as simple as some of these or a little more complicated. Once you know a recipe by heart and you've made it four or five, six times, then you can improvise with that recipe and you feel confident. And I would pick basic recipes, a, a simple braise, a stir fry, um, uh, you know, stir fried rice, for example, is great because you can do a thousand different combinations. Recipes where you can improvise and switch ingredients out. Uh, it could be as simple as boiling a bunch of vegetables in water and serving them with olive oil and salt and pepper or put some scallions on top or whatever you like. Um, just keep it simple and do the same thing over and over. After a while, 
and that's what, you know, the grandmothers used to do. They didn't have 500 recipes. They didn't cook Thai one night and then uh, cook something from Senegal the next night and cook something from, you know, uh, Central America the next night. They, they would have their recipes and they would cook those recipes. And that's why they, they were good cooks because they, um, they didn't constantly try something new. So if you're starting out, pick a handful of recipes, make them all the time, and get good at those. And then, you know, then you can branch out. But the trick, especially if you're cooking two or three meals a day, like many of us are now, uh, is to pick recipes that are foundation recipes that you can vary, right? Things that you can, if you make beans, you can add a million things to beans, right? If you make rice, you can fold in a million things to rice. Uh, things that are sort of, you know, baseline recipes. So that would be my advice. What are some of your uh, ingredient staples? Uh, what, what, is, what do you recommend we always have in our pantry? I think that's really the problem. You know, when I started cooking in the 70s, um, you had to go to Chinatown, you had to go to the Lebanese market, you know, it was hard to find things. Now you can get things virtually overnight um, and it doesn't really cost that much. So a few things, I mean, there's a sort of a South, uh, Southeast Asian pantry, you know, a good oyster sauce, soy sauce, et cetera. Uh, you want that fish sauce. The Middle East has some great ingredients, spice buns like sitar, um, you, pomegranate molasses is another thing you want, tahini. Uh, of course, miso is, you know, from Japanese cooking is a great thing. You can make a stock out of miso and water in two minutes and it's great foundation. And then, you know, the spice cabinet's got more than the usual suspects, right? Cinnamon, nutmeg, mace, et cetera. Uh, obviously, cumin's like the most used. You know, cumin's used in Mexico. It's used in the Middle East. It's used everywhere. Uh, coriander, turmeric, uh, and a few other little more exotic things uh, would be nice. You don't have to get them. Um, things I really like is, you know, there are other peppers than black pepper. There's uh, Aleppo pepper, which used to be from Syria. Now it's, there's, there's Turkish silk chili, the same thing. Um, there are, um, uh, you know, peppers that are sort of dark and chocolatey, like Urfa pepper. These are done, uh, which is also really nice. So having more than one kind of pepper around is great. Um, and I think a finishing salt is also good. Uh, something you put on food after it's cooked, before you serve it. Uh, like a Malden salt is great because it has a lot of crunch to it. Uh, no point in using that in the water for pasta or in a soup. But if you're finishing off, just a really nice salt is really nice, especially if it's big, crunchy kernels. It's terrific. So spices, a Middle Eastern pantry, a Southeast Asian pantry, a Mexican pantry, having a few chilies around. You know, chilies in most places in the world are not really there for heat per se. They're there for flavor. So if you're in Oaxaca or Mexico City, they're going to choose their chilies based on taste, right? They want something fruitier. They want something a little more savory. Uh, and so knowing a little bit about chilies is nice as well. But, you know, if you spend a hundred bucks on some core ingredients in the pantry, then when you want to make a quick dinner on a Tuesday night, you, you know, you have it, you have the fish sauce there, you have the Thai red curry paste, chili paste, uh, you know, those things are there. So someone else essentially developed the flavor for you, right? I mean, the flavor is in the bottle, it's in the jar, it's ready to go. You don't have to spend hours developing it on your own. That's the way I look at it. So it's, it really short circuits a lot of time in the kitchen. Uh, these are two great recipes. What what uh, what are some of your other favorite recipes that made it into the cookbook? There's a lot. Uh, some of the ones I like are are uh, there's there's a whole bunch in a, in a section like tray bakes. Uh, they use tray bakes all over the world, including in the Middle East. Uh, you, you get a, a sheet pan. You can put chicken parts around it. Uh, in the center, you put garlic. You can put onions. You can put herbs. Uh, and then you when you finish cooking, you take the meat off. And you actually make a sauce right there on the pan. You could add a little wine or even just a little water and, and whisk that up. And so it, it makes its own sauce. Um, any kind of stir fry, any kind of pesto is great. Um, one of the recipes I like uh, is a pasta recipe that has Parmesan and oil and lemon. You know, it's about five ingredients. It's very easy to make. Uh, a lot of kebabs, for example, uh, you know, things on skewers, uh, like we have some Moroccan chicken skewers that are fabulous. Again, thin piece of meat, very easily done, nice spice rub, uh, quickly on the grill or in a skillet. Uh, it's very easy to do. So those are just a few of them. You uh, advise home cooks to quote unquote, mix and match. What do you mean by that? Can you, can you give us some examples? Well, as I said earlier, I think the, the point is you wanna develop layers of flavor that are contrasting, right? So 
you might have something hot, but you might have something that's a little bit sweet, right? Or something bitter with something that's sweet. So you might have garlic, you might have lemongrass, you might have chilies. You might have something, uh, you know, in, in Hmong cooking. There's, I just interviewed somebody in Minneapolis who, uh, whose parents came from Laos originally. Well, there are four things in that cuisine, right? There's rice as a base. The rice so soaks up the sauce. Uh, there's a fatty protein of some kind, like pork belly or whatever. Um, there's a vegetable, and then there's a hot sauce, right? Those four things. So that's a good example of mix and match. Something fatty, something fresh with vegetables, something spicy with a sauce, and a baseline, which is rice or grains or whatever you want to use. So I like to think that way. There's always, there's always contrast in what you're preparing. So when you put it in your mouth, you know, it's like, oh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's not just, okay, you know, it's just not just mashed potatoes. There's something else going on. And I think that's a good way of thinking about food because the best recipes do have that contrast, right? I noticed there's not a lot of uh, uh, desserts in the in the book, uh, and then I, I want you to tell us a little about the Swedish sticky chocolate cake. But uh, why why not that many desserts? Well, I think people don't tend to make desserts as much, especially if you want to get dinner on the table quickly. Uh, and desserts don't tend to lend themselves most of the time to quick or fewer ingredients. Um, rice puddings, though, we have a whole section of rice puddings, so you can, those are easy to do, and you can flavor them with cardamom. You can flavor them. With, with lime juice, as you said, or lime zest, you can flavor them any way you like. Uh, the sticky cake is an interesting cake. It's a one bowl cake. Uh, it starts with brown butter, which is really a great technique for any baking recipe that calls for melted butter. Just brown it. Uh, we do chocolate chip cookies with brown butter that are great. Uh, so browning the butter is a way of adding a depth of flavor to the recipe. Uh, and then it has cocoa, it has brown, light brown sugar, has a little bit of flour, et cetera. And uh, it's a one bowl cake. It's like a Betty Crocker one bowl cake. Uh, and you whisk in four eggs, you put it into a nine inch spring form pan into a low oven, 325 oven for half an hour, it's done. The great thing about the cake is it's not a sponge cake, right? It's not, it's not a cake where you have to worry about exactly how you fold everything in. It's a fairly thin cake uh, and the center is sticky, hard to describe. It's not like a fallen chocolate cake that's sort of light uh, it's not super fudgy either, but it has something in between fallen chocolate cake and fudge. So it has a moist, sticky inside, and you can't mess it up. I mean, it is absolutely foolproof. Uh, and it's a one bowl cake. You don't have to get the mixer out. You don't have to whip egg whites, all the other stuff. So uh, that is really a go-to dessert if you want a chocolate dessert. So and again, another pandemic-related question. Uh, the kids are home all day. Um, um, it'd be nice <laughs> if they helped. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Any advice on uh, on how to get kids into some of these cookish recipes? Yeah, I, I interviewed a food scientist uh, not too long ago who said something interesting. He said that up until two years old, kids are open to flavors. They may not like it the first time you give it to them, but if you give it to them a second time, uh, they are fairly open. Between ages two and four, that window sort of closes down. Um, Actually, I have a 25-year-old. It's closed since he was two. So it's been 23 years. We're hoping someday it reopens. But anyway, um, at four, uh, it start, they start to you know, take a little more chances with flavors. Um, with all my kids, I have lots of kids, uh, we have never done a special meal for the kids uh, unless they're you know, very, very young. So we cook dinner, and um, they can have dinner or not. Uh, they can have fruit for dessert if they like. I mean, fruit for dinner or whatever. <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not going to feed them something that's highly spiced. Um, but I know a lot of people, uh, Kenji Lopez Alt, uh, who wrote the food lab book, uh, well known in the food world. He used to work with me a long time ago. Uh, he has a three and a half year old daughter, almost four year old daughter. And he cooks all sorts of interesting food with lots of spices and she loves it. So I think we should get over our fear of, you know, if they don't like it, uh, cooking something bland, uh, something brown and bland. <laughs> No, I think I think kids will like most things. Uh, you just have to keep trying. Otherwise, th they're never going to get in the habit, and then it's going to be steak and salad and mashed potatoes for the rest of their lives. Let's talk a little about the various fishes, you know, the salmon versus the cod and the halibut. And what are some of your favorite uh, fish uh, fishes to, to cook with? Uh, halibut is my favorite. It's, it's also the most expensive, uh, so I don't cook it that often. 
Uh, it's very meaty and dense. It's great on the grill. Uh, and I make a very simple salsa to finish it, um, just to pour on at the end, uh, which is really nice. You can also use a spice rub uh, on, a, on halibut. Uh, salmon uh, is great. You can cook salmon in about 11 or 12 minutes in a skillet. I use lemon slices and parsley stems as a base, a little bit of white wine, essentially braises or steams in the skillet very quickly. That's nice. Uh, we also have a recipe uh, in the book actually, where you take four fillets of center cut salmon, you put them in aluminum foil, uh, you create a papillote, you know, you roll it up uh, and you uh, put that in a skillet on the oven, on top of the stove uh, and it heat, you heat it up and it puffs up and you take it off the heat and let it finish cooking. It's absolutely fabulous. And then you can add a tremula or, or a pesto or whatever you want to finish. But that's a really simple way of doing it. It's very, you know, aluminum foil cooking on the uh, on the manifold in the car concept, but it actually works on the stovetop. Um, I like really plain whitefish like cod, uh, which people don't seem to buy very much anymore, but it's it's easy to cook. It's got a nice clean flavor, goes with other things. Um, I, and I, I tend to grill most of my fish, you know, pretty quickly and just keep it simple. What about some roasting tips? Uh, we're quite fond of roasting in my household. Uh, pointers or tips about roasting? Uh, sure. Uh, if you want to roast, uh, low and slow is better than high. Um, the higher the oven temperature, assuming it's not a tenderloin, if it's a bigger piece of meat, uh, like a pork shoulder, for example, or a chuck, uh, if you use a high temperature in the oven, that temperature is going to overcook the outside by the time the inside comes up to temperature. Uh, so the outside could be 200 degrees, for example, before the inside's 125 or 30 or pork 140. So I would keep it low and slow. That's really the best way to go. Um, for stews, um, if you, uh, we do a lot of stews here where we don't saute the meat at all. Um, and we, we cook the onions a little bit. Uh, don't use much liquid. Uh, cook it for an hour and a half or so with the top on, then take the top off to finish. And the meat, uh, is not totally submerged in the liquid and will brown really nicely in the oven. The oven does all the work for you. Um, also, you know, which I, surprises me, a lot of French recipes, you know, have you constantly browning meat for the Maillard reaction, you know, which gives you that rich flavor. But if you have three or four pounds of meat, you don't really need more Maillard reaction. You got plenty of umami in the meat. Uh, so very, like there's a lot of Italian recipes, for example, that don't do that because they want to balance out the meat flavor with other things. You know, it might be olives, it might be orange, it might be whatever you're using. Uh, so you don't really have to brown the meat, which makes stews much, much easier. But low and slow is really best for the big cuts. Uh, and then a, a very small cut, like a tenderloin, you can do at a high temperature, that's fine. But every, the big stuff you really want to keep in a low oven. It's sort of like doing a barbecue, it's very similar. Did you, um, uh, could you comment a little bit about sort of some of the regional flavors in, in the U.S. and uh, any, some of your favorites and, and if any have crept into some of the recipes here? So now I get to piss off everybody else in the country. <laughs> this, is like, this is like going to an event and asking, what's your favorite restaurant in our city? You know, it's like there is no right answer to that question. Um, yeah, I, I think, look. What's really interesting, if you look uh, at this country, is there's a big Kurdish population in Nashville, for example, right? I mean, there's a Haitian uh, community outside of Boston. So once you get beyond all the obvious stuff, you know, the Southwest and the South and the, the Midwest and all those sort of standard uh, descriptions of American food, uh, it turns out that there are all these subcultures uh, that have wonderful food and have existed for, in many cases, many generations. And so when you take a deeper dive into American cooking, you find it's a lot more interesting than I thought back in the 70s. Uh, and, and the way they have integrated there, as I just mentioned, the, the Hmong chef you know, uh, in Minneapolis, how they've integrated their food with what's available here and understand how that works. You know, food, we always have this argument about authenticity in food, right? Uh, it seems to me that, there's no such thing really uh, because food like language changes all the time so if if you watch food and, and what happens it's always getting uh changed by other cultures by war right by people uh emigrating immigrating 
by people from different towns, by different ingredients, by, uh, you know, the, the, the landscape changes, the, the weather changes, different things are grown now in different places. They're making champagne in Britain now, you know, of all things. Maybe, maybe British champagne will be the toast of the town in 50 years and <laughs> French won't be making it anymore. Uh, if you go through the Middle East, you know, it's not just a function of uh, Mohadra or, or something else, kofta being cooked one way in Turkey versus in Lebanon. It's town to town, it's house to house. So when I look at a place like America, you know, there's a million way to make biscuits. You can make, you know, Maryland beaten biscuits. You can do the, the, the sort of a Southern biscuit style. You can do a New England baking powder biscuit. Uh, you can do biscuits that are layered and rolled and shaped. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different cream biscuits from James Beard. So the complexity of it is what's interesting. And, you know, it's sort of like when I started cooking, you know, there was one expert on Indian cooking, right? And then there was, you know, Paula Wolford did Morocco and, and Diana Kennedy did Mexico, you know? And that was ridiculous because, you know, the, Mexico's full of all sorts of cuisines. India has dozens of different regions and cuisines. The Philippines from the North and Southeast and the West, the, you know, spicier in the, in, in the South, obviously, because it's a different culture. So once you get into those cultures, you realize it's incredibly complex. And so I've sort of given up on trying to describe regions uh, because even even in Mumbai, for example, uh, you know, Nick Sharma's from there. I mean, I'm sure you could find 10 different versions of the same recipe, right? Depending on which household you happen to go into and based upon where the people were from originally. Um, a couple, a couple more questions, Christopher, uh, and we really appreciate your time. Onions. Can we talk a little bit about the different type of onions and, and where best to use different different ones, whether it's sure. what, whether, whether it, when it's raw or when it's cooked? Yeah, uh, the yellow onion is the one that has uh, more flavor when cooked because all those, you know, raw sulfurous fumes actually turn sweet when you cook it. So if you want an onion that has a lot of flavor after cooking, the yellow onion is really the one that's the best. Um, obviously you can get Vidalia is another thing, sweet onions, which are nice for raw, a red onions also, I would use a red onion and a salsa or something as raw, but the sort of the go-to onion, if you really want a lot of flavor in the onion and sweetness in the onion is really the yellow onion. It's sort of, it's counterintuitive, right? If you start with a sweet onion, you think you end up with a sweeter product at the end, but actually the yellow onion is going to give you the, the richest flavor and actually the most, uh, sweetness when you're finished cooking. One of the industries, obviously lots of industries have been severely impacted by the pandemic, but one is restaurants. And most restaurants are obviously designed to, you know, turn a table over two or three times a night and operate at ideally well more than 25% capacity. Uh, what is, uh, what do you think is going to happen to restaurants in the near term? And what can restaurants do to make certain recipes more uh, sort of attractive for takeout, let's say. Is there anything that you think? That's a, that's a good question. And it's one we thought about a lot. You know, we know a lot of people, uh, a lot of people have worked in restaurants who are here. Um, we know a lot of people in the industry or good friends. Uh, it's, uh, it's devastating. Um, I just went to my coffee shop this morning, Pauly's. I go there every morning, uh, like a 6.15. Uh, they're closing, you know, indefinitely. Uh, and this is a tiny little shop, half the size of an RV, so they don't have big overhead. They just don't have the volume. So I, I don't know the answer. We discuss it all the time. Uh, it is devastating. The, the only times I've seen people who have managed to respond to make a living is they've turned themselves into grocery stores, right? Because uh, a friend of mine, for example, in Cambridge, Boston, he has lots of connections with local farmers. You know, he gets the best apples. He gets this. He gets that. He gets oysters. So uh, he uh, ha has, a, he's a bakery, but he also has a restaurant. He's using his sources to turn his store uh, into his restaurant, into uh, essentially a grocery store. Uh, and we order a lot from him now. And so instead of going to the big supermarket, we can go to a guy two blocks away uh, who has better stuff and we're supporting him, which is great. Uh, and he's transitioned the business into being a supplier of, of raw ingredients as well as being someone who can sell you finished food. So they're doing, you know, cooked food takeout, they're doing baked goods, and they're also doing raw ingredients like a grocery store. So he's doing all three. You know, I see him out there all day with a mask on, you know, people would pick up outside. It's, uh, he's working very long hours. But the restaurant itself, I don't understand how that gets fixed. Uh, you know, there's, 
people have done well with outdoor dining. Uh, we've done that a few times, but it's <laughs> outdoor dining in January in Boston's, I don't know, <clears throat> seems, seems tough. So uh, we really hope they can hold on because it's, uh, I think of all the industries, that's, that's going to be really hard hit. Uh, one last question, and again, it's pandemic related. Uh, someone says, um, uh, I've put on the COVID-19, as have lots of people during this pandemic. What sort of foods uh, can you think I can get sufficient taste and nourishment from and avoid, you know, uh, putting on weight from eating? Um, I actually, I've never thought about that. <laughs> I was going like, maybe can't we use this time to like just eat what we want? I mean, there's got to be something positive here. I uh, know it's a good question. Um, well, if you think about, um, we're working on a Mediterranean book now. Now, obviously the Mediterranean diet is, is kind of made up because if you look at the 17 countries or whatever it is around the Mediterranean, they do eat meat and they eat lots of other stuff. It's not just fish and white wine and salads, <clears throat> but what they do, they do two things. They put vegetables at the center of the plate, right? It's not just around the plate. Uh, and most cultures use meat sparingly because it's expensive and they use it as a flavoring. So use meat as a flavoring, put the vegetables in the center of the plate. And the other thing I would say is grains, you know, rice, et cetera, bulgur, et cetera. Those are really good things as sort of a base. I, I very often start dinner with cooking grains of some kind and then putting something on top of it. Uh, so a little bit of flavoring on top. So having grains as your base and then vegetables at the center of the plate. Uh, and most cultures are very good at turning vegetables. I mean, go back to uh, Yotam Adolenghi, right? When he first started years ago, he was a master of adding flavor to vegetables. It was mostly vegetables, right? Like plenty, his book. So that's that's the way to do it. Um, so I, I, I go out and buy a copy of Plenty. Now, his ingredient list sometimes aren't short. But the ideas are good. I mean, you know, for example, he'll he'll caramelize onions and put them on lentils. Well, that's that's a classic Middle Eastern dish: rice, lentils, and caramelized onions. I mean, that's that's the Middle East comfort food. A term I don't like very much, but uh, you can serve that to your kids. You can serve that for dinner. That's it. You know, uh, he might throw in some gorgonzola, you know, <laughs> along the way. But just caramelizing onions is a great way of adding flavor to a simple, you know, pulse like lentils. Thanks a lot, uh, Christopher. It's great having you back at Live Talks Los Angeles. Um, and I hope those of you who are watching it will try both these recipes. Um, Christopher's new book is Milk Street Cookish. Throw it together, big flavors, simple techniques, 200 ways to reinvent dinner. And it is available wherever books are sold. Thanks, Christopher. My pleasure. Next time, can I be on with Matthew McConaughey? Can I just, can we do it, the two of us together, please? Perfect. And we'll tie it to regional cooking in Austin. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Take care.